I have the uh, pleasure of introducing myself. So my name is Neil Levin. I am a partner at Freeborn and Peters, and I head the fraud and internal investigations team at Freeborn and Peters in Chicago. Uh, we're in the business of investigating, prosecuting, and recovering from all sorts of fraud, and we focus primarily on two pieces of, uh, well, two elements to our team that are supportive of our success. One is the use of intelligence. We have our own intelligence team that we deploy uh, for every one of our cases. And two is the use of psychological profiling of the fraudster. So today, that's what we're going to talk about, which is pretty much my favorite subject. But first, a pop quiz. Hope everyone pays very careful attention. We've got uh, one question for you today, and we'll see who the winner is. Give me the last name of the very first Ponzi schemer. Ponzi? Everyone say Ponzi. It's not Ponzi. Nope, it's not Ponzi. William Miller, 1899, was actually documented as being the first Ponzi schemer. Did exactly what Ponzi did, although with a slightly different vehicle. Uh, I quote, he had the inside window into the ways profitable companies operated. And for 10 years thereafter, his only inside window was that of a jail cell. But he was not the biggest. Uh, that's why Charles Ponzi got the namesake, and that happened in 1920. So, a little trivia for you. Uh, next, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. I am not a behavioral scientist. Uh, I was a psychology major in college, which of course gave me license to figure out everything that was wrong with my family and my friends. But other than that, I am not a scientist. Uh, I am not up here professing uh, anything that I based on my own scientific research. Uh, what we do, though, is we study the research of others, and we use that in our law practice. So I am an attorney. I am an attorney who uses psychological profiling to our advantage, and so we study this stuff, our team studies this stuff all the time because it's essential, and we'll talk more about why it's essential as we move along. So that's my legal disclaimer. I am not a behavioral scientist. Uh, set, and then I'll make a promise. My promise is that this conversation will be roughly 5% law, if that. So, uh, as much as I'm a lawyer and we practice law, I'm not going to talk about the law. We we'll talk about something we use to help us with the law, and that is the study of the fraudster. So, with that, why don't you watch this one for just a couple minutes? of Neanderthal all the way up through Madoff. And so to get there, we first have to ask ourselves, well, what is fraud? We can go into the difficult definitions of fraud. Uh, fraud is an intentional perversion of truth for the purpose of inducing another and reliance upon blah, 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 blah. Uh, we've got this definition from Black's Law Dictionary, a false representation of matter of fact, whether by words or by conduct, by false or misleading allegations, blah, 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 blah. Really, to get to fraud, I think the best way to define it is how we see it every day. So let's talk about the types of fraud first. So we've got many. I'm sure you've been all involved in some aspect of these. Ponzi schemes, of course, one of our favorites. Occupational fraud, fraud that happens from within the organization. Say you're vice president of transportation, creating his own company to build a company. Uh, all sorts of transportation charges that never occurred. Insurance fraud, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in that over the years. Uh, tax fraud, of course. Government corruption. We've got bank fraud. We've got mortgage fraud. Asset misappropriation and concealment. Corporate governance. We've got bankruptcy fraud, and of course, we've got a couple of our favorites, FCPA uh, and offshore financial centers, which is, of course, why we're here. So let's look at how fraud cases come to us. Is another way of telling us what really is this fraud that we're talking about. It comes to us from banking clients. comes to us from insurance company clients. comes to us from municipal or local governments and the investigations on corruption, uh, corporations, board-level investigations, uh, which also leads to FCPA and, and the like. Uh, investors bring us cases relative to fraud. 
It's probably going to have some investors in some of these cases that David was just showing you in the session before. Uh, receivers and trustees hire us in bankruptcies and other civil proceedings to uh, ferret out fraud and recover from fraud. And typically fraud comes to us when something stinks. Uh, this is a, a label that I actually like quite finely from one of my clients who said, the time to call Neil is when the case stinks. Uh, another one of my clients says, call Neil because he's like Mr. Wolf from Pulp Fiction. So when things go terribly bad and you need to bring in the help to clean it up, call Neil. So this is how the case comes to us. Well, when does the case come to us? The case comes to us when these three intersect, incentive, opportunity, and rationalization. And we're going to think about this time and time again today, incentive, opportunity, rationalization. As we talk about the fraudster, let's talk about what was the incentive, what was the opportunity, and what was the rationalization. One of the big incentives or opportunities at this particular point in time of our uh, economic landscape uh, is, uh, I think, illustrated best with Warren Buffett's saying, every now and then the tide goes out and you see he's been swimming naked. So when the bubble burst several years back, the tide went out and we saw a lot of people swimming naked because most of these Ponzi schemes were around for a very long time. These were not one-year schemes, two-year schemes, even five or ten-year schemes. These were 20 and 